Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Jia Kong, and uh, I'm from Zhou Yu Holloway University of London, and I'm currently a PhD student of my supervisor, Professor Gregory Guting, who just gave you a lecture. And it is just nice to be here talking about digraphs, which I'm currently working on. And I hope you guys will like these topics. So my email has been shown on this slide. So if you have any questions regards these topics, I will talk in this lecture as well as some, maybe some other problems um, in digraphs, please feel free to send me an email and I will try my best to answer it. So anyway, now please let me start my lecture. So my lecture will contain these three sections. The first section is about the uh, Hamilton cycles in tournaments. Maybe some of you may not be that familiar with this topic. So let me start with some basic definitions that will be used. So in a digraph D, a vortex Y is said to be reachable from another vortex X if there is a XY path, that's to say a directed path from X to Y. So in particular, we define that every vortex is reachable from itself. And a digraph is said to be strong if every pair of vortexes is reachable from each other. So uh, for every pair of vortex X and Y, there is both a XY path and YX path. A tournament is a digraph where there is exactly one arc between every pair of vort vortices. So one may obtain a tournament from a complete graph by just assigning for each edge a direction. Uh, Hamilton cycle is a cycle that contains all the vortexes in D. And we also say that a digraph is Hamiltonian if it has a Hamilton cycle. So one may observe that if you have a Hamilton cycle, then through the cycle, every pair of vortexes can be reached from each other. Thus, um, every Hamiltonian digraph is necessarily strong. So KMM proved that for, for tournaments, the sufficiency is also true. Just to say, every strong tournament also has a Hamilton, Hamilton cycle. While Moon kind of generalized this result by proving that every strong tournament is vortex pancyclic, well, a digraph is said to be vortex pancyclic if for every vortex X in D and for all integers K from three, four up to N, there exists a K path through X in D. So in particular, there exists a N cycle through X in D, which is a Hamilton cycle. So now I'll give this proof of give the proof of serum seven. I approve this serum by induction. So the first step is that I'll show you that for every vortex X, um, there is a triangle through X in D. So take any vortex X here and let um, plus X be our neighborhood and minus X is in neighborhood. Because this digraph is strong, then clearly this two set is both non empty. And because we are talking about tournament here, so this is all the vortex in the graph. And one may observe that there must be an arc from the all neighborhood to the in neighborhood. 
because if there is not, then all the arcs goes from n minus x to n plus x. And that would mean any vertex, any vertex in x plus, uh, in n plus x cannot, cannot reach um, any vertex in n minus x. So contradicts to, to this diagram is strong. So there must be an arc in this direction. So let this arc be y and z. We can say that x, y, z is now a triangle that through x. So now let us assume that um, by induction hypothesis that there is a k plus one cycle, a k sorry k minus one cycle. which is C. And if we have a vortex outside C that let's say Z, it has in neighbors, both in neighbors and all neighbors on C, then clearly we can take the last in neighbors in here and let it be X i plus one, uh, sorry, x i, and uh, the, the next label must be all label. So let it be x plus i plus one. Yeah, so we can construct our k pass here. So let's now assume that such vortex do not exist. And that would mean that would mean the other part of the vortexes can be partitioned into two parts. Part one A is those vortexes who only dominates by, by the vortexes in C. And uh, the part P is those vortexes that dominates all the vortexes in C. And by the similar argument um, for strong digraph, there must be an arc from A to B. Let's see this arc is Y and Z. And clearly we can take three consecutive vortexes, Xi, Xi plus one, Xi plus two here, such that Xi plus one is not equal to X. And we can find our K path Here. which is through X. So this completes the proof. Um, although this proof is kind of easy, uh, I believe it is uh, kind of uh, hard to digest in sh such a short time. So I will give you one minute to think about this induction proof. Then I will continue with a more far more complicated result about Hamilton cycle. Okay, so now let me go to the next section. So the next section is about the Hamilton cycle in degree constricted digraphs. So in this section, I want to talk about some sufficient conditions that guaranteed a digraph to have Hamilton cycle. So now I will show you the main result I want to talk about in this part. So a pair of vortexes X and Y is said to be a dominated pair if there exists a vortex Z that dominates them both. 
And the following theory is proved by Van Jensen, Guting, and Lee gave us a sufficient condition for digraph that might have Hamilton cycles to have a Hamilton cycle. Namely, let D be a strong digraph. Know that we already show that uh, strong is a necessary condition for a digraph to have um, Hamilton cycle. So if if every dominated pair x y, which is non-adjacent, so there is no x here, and if x y is dominated pair, for each such pair, if we assume um, the degree of one of them is at least n, and the other is at least n minus one, then we can claim that D has a Hamilton cycle. So the main objective I wish to accomplish in this section is to give you a detailed proof for this theorem. But before I do that, I need to introduce you to an important technique called multi-insertion technique, which will be used later in the main proof of this theorem. So let us, let us consider two disjoint paths P and Q. So just like uh, what has been shown on the figure here, P is the path U1, U2 up to US, and Q is the path U1, U2 up to UT. We see that P can be inserted into Q means there exists two consecutive vortices, Vi and Vi plus one in Q, such that Vi dominates U1 and Us dominates Vi plus one. So in this case, um, we may replace this arc here by the longer path here. So if we do that, we can get a, a longer path that visits all the vortexes in P and Q. Um, but sometimes if P cannot be directly inserted into Q, it sounds reasonable to try to partition P into several subpasses and then insert every subpasses of P into Q. Um, for example, um, uh, if we have some integers, I1, I2, up to I m, and that, that separate those, this path P here into the subpath from U one to ui two minus one from uik minus one to uik and then minus one and from uim minus one to uis which is equal to the uim and the minus one if we have such a partition such that each part can be inserted into q that means there are some arcs that can be inserted into, then we say that um, P can be inserted into, P can be multi-inserted into Q. So if this partition exists, we want to try if we can also find a longest path that contains all the vortexes in P and Q. And one may observe that if those subpaths can all be inserted into different arcs in Q. Um, for example, if this subpass here can be inserted into the arcs here. So let me draw that. And this subpass here can be inserted into the arc here. And this subpass here can be inserted into the arc here. Then we may find this um, 
required pass by just replacing each arc by the corresponding subpasses, as well as these two arcs that contain connecting them. So we will get a required pass in here. So, um, so if this is the case, we can easily find this pass. Um, therefore, the main problem we need to figure out is um, what should we do if two subpaths can only be inserted into the same arc, like what has been shown in the figure here. Um, this subpath, this subpath, and this subpath can only be inserted into this arc here. Um, what should we do if we want to find this required path that visit all the vortexes in P and Q? Um, so we may, I may give you 10 seconds to think about it because it's really obvious. Um, okay, I guess many of you have already figured that out. If this is the case, then why not we just merge all the subpaths here into one and try to try to insert this this whole path here into the arc here. So we will get a our path like this. Okay. Thus, that, that, that tells us uh, if P can be multi-inserted into Q, then we can find the path that visits all the vortexes in P and Q. Uh, which is the first part of the following lemma 11. And the second part of this lemma states that not only we can find this path, uh, not only this path exists, um, we can find this path in polynomial time. And I'm gonna skip the proof of the first part because I have already shown you the idea. And uh, one just need to consider a partition with a minimum number of subpasses. So, And also the proof of the second part, I will leave it to the end of the lecture because it's not that relevant to uh, what I'm going to talk about um, in the rest of the lecture. So I will show you the proof if I still have time. So let me now escape the proof of the lemma. Okay, the following simple lemma is also quite useful. It states that uh, if P is a pass, or uh, if Q is a pass, sorry, from V1, V2 to Vt, and W is a, a, a ambitory vortex that outside, outside Q. If W cannot be inserted into Q, that means that there do not exist two consecutive vortexes in Q such that the first vortex is dominates W and the second vortexes are dominated by W. So if this, if W cannot be inserted into Q, then we can get that the degree of W in Q, which means the number of the out degree plus the number of the uh, the number of the out labor plus the number of in labor in Q should be less than or equal to t plus one. And uh, in addition, if t do not 
Vt do not dominate Vw, then this upper bound will reduce by one. And I will show you the proof now. So uh, for every arc A, we define a indicator, I A, an indicator Well, I a equal to one when a is a what is a arc in D, and otherwise we define it to be zero. So let's consider this sum this following summation. I the I w plus I w v i plus one sums over i from i equal to one to t minus one and also to missing edge here one is uh, v t to w and the other is i believe is w to v one mm. one can see that this term the sum of this term at uh, this term adds up, adds up to the integral of w in q. And these two terms adds up to the L degree of w in q. So they finally adds up to the degree of w in q. And from our assumption, w cannot be inserted into q. So this term, every term, Every this term should be less than or equal to one. So this term is bounded above by t minus one, and this two term is at most two. So we get our t plus one here. And if uh, Vt does not dominate W, then this term also equal to zero, and clearly this upper bound will reduce by one. And also if we Further assume that W do not dominate V1, then this term is also equal to zero. Then we will have our T our upper bound of T minus one here. And in the last lecture, my supervisor have gave you some uh, have given you two kinds of proof of how to prove the fact that every tournament has a Hamilton cycle. One is by the median order and other is by contradiction. So I would like to give you one minute to think about this lemma and try to use this lemma 12 to prove this fact. And then I will go on with the proof of the main theory, which is the hardest one, it is the hardest one in my lecture. Okay, uh, I guess many of you have just uh, have already figured that out. And uh, we, to prove this, to prove this fact, uh, we just need to consider the longest pass in a tournament, say P. And uh, if P is not a Hamilton, a Hamilton pass, then there must be another vortex outside P. And because P is the longest pass, there cannot be arcs from the end, the terminal vortex to W or from the W to the starting point. 
And clearly, W also cannot be inserted into Q also because P is the longest path. So just use the lemma to help, we will get the degree of the degree of W in Q is equal to um uh, is less than or equal to T minus one. But we but this is impossible because we are talking about tournaments here. The degree of every vortex in uh, outside Q in Q should be equal to T. So a contradiction and uh, the proof is complete. So now um, I want to start to prove the main theory of this section. Um, before I do that, I want to restate the same theory here, just in case you have just, uh, you have already forgot it. And so a dominated pair x, y is a pair such that, is a pair x, y such that there is another vortex C that dominates both of them. And uh, the theorem states that if for every dominates the pair, that is non-adjacent. One of the vortex has degree at least n, and the other has degree at least n minus one, then we have a Hamilton cycle. So now let me begin to prove this uh, theorem here. So we want to prove this by contradiction. First, let me assume that D is non-Hamiltonian. So there is no Hamiltonian Hamilton path. And let C be the longest cycle in D. So say the longest cycle. And I will first show that D contains a C bypass. As, um, by C bypass, I mean a, a path that starts and uh, and uh, to see in different vortexes. And internally this joint to see. That means uh, a path that starts and end in different vortex of C and uh, those vortex that in the middle a lot lies on C. So exactly like what I have drawn here. And the last requirement is that its length should be greater than or equal to two. So this is a say by, bypass. So we, we prove this by, by contradiction. We now assume that D contains no C bypass. Then because C is not a Hampton cycle and D is strong, there must be a arc from C to another vortex here. And by extending this, uh, this arc, we, can, we must finally arrive or the same starting point here because there is no say, by, say bypass. You cannot arrive at any other vertex. So let's assume without loss of generality that this vertex is X1 and it's our labor on say X2 and it's our labor on this, this cycle here. We then need P by Z. So we can see that X1 dominates Z and X2. So Z and X2 is a dominated pair of X1. And we can also say that Z and X2 is not adjacent because if they are, then no matter what direction is this arc, we can find the Z bypass from X1, X2 to X1 or from X1 to X2. So by our assumption, we will have the degree of Z plus the degree of X2 is at least two and minus one. But now let us look 
carefully at the, de the sum degree of x2 and z. Um, we may separate into every turn into two parts, the degree of z in p and c plus the degree of x2 in p and c plus the degree of z in r, which we define r to be the rest of the graph, which is d minus the vortexes in p and c and plus the degree of x2 in r. So let, let's look at every term. So for the first term, the degree of um, z in p and c, we can observe that z cannot have neighbors in, uh, in c, that be, or c, sorry, c minus x1, because uh, for the same, actually for the same reason, um, because if, if z has a labor here somewhere, xt, then no matter what the direction is, there must be a uh, say bypass from xt to x1 or from x1, from x1 to xt. So that tells us that the degree of z is at most two times the order of p minus one. And by the similar uh, argument, we can get that the degree of uh, the degree of x two is at most two times the order of c minus one. And for these two terms, we look at every vortex w in R. One can observe that um, there cannot be both arc from x2 to w and from w to z, because if there are, then this would form a C bypass. And by the uh, same reason, for the same reason, there cannot be arcs from both from x z to w and from w to x2 because this would form a C bypass. So this term is bounded above by two times the order of R. And the order of R is equal to M minus the order of P minus the order of C plus one, because X1 is both in P and uh, C. So this is equal to two times M minus P minus c plus one. So something got crossed out. Left up with two times n minus one, which is lower than the, which is lower than the lower bound here. And this is impossible. So we arrive a contradiction here. Therefore, C must have a C bypass. So now we know that uh, C have a C bypass. We let this C bypass be Q, be P. P is from U1 to US, where U1 is equal to X1, and uh, the last vortex is UX. We let it be X gamma plus one. And we can also assume without of without loss of generality that um, this gap here is the minimum. So so or equivalently, gamma is the minimum among all the gaps of the C bypass. So because C is the longest pass, uh, we cannot C is the longest pass, and this is the C bypass. P is the C bypass who has length at least two. So here can not be only one arc because otherwise this cycle here would be longer than C. So gamma should be greater than or equal to two. And now we let 
P1 to be the subpath from on C from X2 to X gamma and uh, P2 from the subpath in the rest of C from X gamma plus 1 to X1. Um, so P1 and P2. Okay, let me just um, copy this graph and uh, put it in the next page. So the first fact I want to show you is that the degree of xk for every xk in p1, so for any vortex xk in p1, the degree of xk plus the degree of u2, which is the second vortex on the C bypass, p here, is at most of this number. And we will, I will try to show you in detail. So we separate this summation into six terms. The sum of xk and u2 in p1 and the sum of xk and u2 in r, which is de defined here, the rest of the graph. And uh, the sum of degree, sum of xk, degree of xk, and uh, the degree of u2 in, oh, sorry, I made a typo here, p2, p2, okay. Um, for this term, I just gave a trivial bound, which is two times the order of P1 minus, uh, minus one. And for this term, um, U2, we can observe that U2 cannot have any all labor in, in here. Because if it have, then we will have got a C bypass um, of, of gap less than gamma. So this degree here should be zero. And for this two term, we carry out similar argument for every W in R minus U2. We can say that there cannot be both arc from XK to W and from W to U2 because this would form a say bypass with shorter gap. And also there cannot be an arc from uh, both, both arc from U2 to W and from W to XK because here should form say another say bypass with short gap. So this term is bounded above by two times the order of R minus one. And we leave this term. And for this term, we can observe that U2 cannot be inserted into P, P2. Because if it can, then we can, by, by lemma 11, we can form a longer cycle than C that contains U2. So by, so by lemma, so by lemma 12, because U2 cannot be inserted into P2, then the degree of U2 in P2 should be less than or equal to the order of P2 plus one. So plus the order of P2 plus one. And this term is equal to M minus P1 and minus P2. 
So we can see that here, here is a 2n, and uh, this cross out, this cross out left with a minus p2. And uh, for the constant, we got minus 3. And for this term, is left here. So we have verified this formula 1. So by this formula 1, we know that every vortex uh, xk in p1 um, has this up an upper bound for its degree. And in particular, if xj is not only in p1, but also dominated by x1, uh, dominated by x1, then xj is clearly, X, xj and u2 is clearly a dominated pair of x1, and they are clearly non-adjacent, as I, as I have shown you. So by the assumption we have this low, lower bound, then finally we'll got that xj should be, the degree of xj in p2 should be greater than the order of p2 plus two, which means by lemma, by lemma 12, xj can be inserted into. into P2. So in particular, X2 can be inserted into PQ. And uh, so what situation we have, uh, we have our longest pass say here. And uh, we got this say bypass X1 to X gamma plus one, and we have x2 can be inserted into p2 here, p2 here, but clearly not all of the, all the vortex of x p1 can be inserted into p2 because if it is, then we can use the lemma 11 to construct a longest pass that I just construct a longer path that con contains all the vortexes in P1, P2, as well as this say, bypass P here. So there must exist a maximum number x beta minus one such that um, the path from x2 to x beta minus one can be multi-inserted into P2, but the x just the path from x2 to x beta cannot. So in particular, x beta cannot be inserted into P2. So now we can show that the degree of uh, x beta is at most n minus two. First by the formula one, we get the degree of x beta plus the degree of u2 is bounded above by this term. And uh, And we have, we clearly have that x1 cannot, do not dominate beta, x beta, because if it does, then, um, then x1 can be, uh, then x beta can, can be inserted into p2, as we have discussed here. So, um, so x1 is not dominates x beta. Therefore, by lemma 12, we'll get that the degree of x beta in P2 should be uh, at most the order of P2. So what we have here, we have the degree of x beta plus the degree of u2 should be at most 2n minus 3. And X1 dominates U2 and X2. And U2 and X2 is clearly non-adjacent. So by our assumption, the degree of U2 should be greater than or equal to M minus one. Therefore, the degree of X beta should be less than or equal to M minus two. So we get our formula three here.
So let's see the picture. We got our x2 to x beta minus one, which can be inserted into this, this path P2 here. So there must exist a number x alpha such that x alpha and x beta minus one can be inserted into P2. But, sorry, but x beta cannot. So there must exist by our, by our definition of, uh, of multi-insertion, there must exist two uh, consecutive vortexes, xi and xi plus one, such that xi dominates x2, oh, sorry, not x2, xi dominates x alpha and x beta minus one dominates x i plus one. So one can say that x beta minus one dominates pair x beta and uh, x i plus one. So, but, but the degree of x beta is less than or equal to n minus two by our, by our formula three. So these two vortices cannot be um, cannot be non-adjacent by our assumption. And so what the what's the direction it should be? It can be direction from x can't be di direction from x i plus one to x beta because if so, then we can inserts the subpass here to p to p2 oh sorry i make a mistake i cannot be should cannot be this direction because if it is this direction then we can insert the subpass into p2 so the direction must be from xi plus one to x beta. And for similar reason, we can observe that again, x to x i plus one dominates x i plus two and uh, x beta. So there must be a direct, there must be an arc between them. And for the similar reason, the arc must be in this direction. So finally, we will get to eternally use this argument. Finally, we will get that x1 dominates x beta, which is impossible because we have shown that x1 do not dominate x beta. So we arrive a contradiction here and the proof is complete. So I want to end this section by telling you a way to get result about the Hamilton path from a result uh, about the Hamilton cycle. Recall that a Hamilton path is a path that visits all the vortexes in D. And um, the following proposition actually gave us a, a sufficient condition for digraphs to have a Hamilton path, namely a digraph has a Hamilton path if and only if uh, another digraph D star, which is obtained from D by adding a vortex X star and all the arcs between them. If and only if this graph D star has a Hamilton cycle. And the proof of this proposition is quite straightforward. One just need to observe that any Hamilton path in D together with X star will form a Hamilton cycle in D star. And from any Hamilton cycle in D star, we can obtain a Hamilton path in D by just deleting the vortex X star. 
So this is the case. And uh, although this proposition is very simple, as we can see, one can use it to derive sufficient condition for digraphs to have a Hampton pass from uh, from a sufficient condition that a digraph has a Hampton path, Hampton cycle, just like what I have just proved. So now I want to give you one minute to think about the serine and try to derive this serine 15 by yourself. And then I will go on with the next topic. Okay, I guess many of you has already figured that out. So let me continue with the next topics. The next topics is about the kin in digraphs, especially the four kings um, in semi-complete multipartite digraphs. So let me first give some basic definition here. Given a pair of vortexes U and V, the distance from U to V is, a, um, is defined as the shortest path, the length of the shortest path from U to V, which is clearly an analog of the term distance in undirected graphs. So I guess you have already familiar with this term. And our king in digraph D, our king U means a vortex such that um, the distance from this vortex to every other vortex is at most at most r, so and know that the source in source is a vortex with integral zero. So one may observe that uh, if a digraph has more than one source, um, because the source cannot be reached by any vortex simply simply because it do not have any neighbors. So if a, if a digraph has more than two source, ha, has more, more than two source, then there cannot be any R king where R is finite. So in this section, I will, to, so for this problem, we may always assume that we can, we are considering digraphs with at most one source. So one natural generalization of tournaments is a semi-complete multipartite digraphs. A digraph is called semi-complete multipartite if it, it can be obtained from a complete multipartite digraph, uh, sorry, complete multipartite graph. So many independent sets and all arcs between them by replacing every arc uh, from by a re replacing every edge by an arc or a pair of, or a pair of arcs. So the following is an example of semi-complete multipartite digraph, where k a bar, k b bar, k c, and k d bar indicates the independent set of of order a b c and d. And uh, this is actually a semi-complete bipartite digraph with Ka and Kb to be the one part and Kb, Kd be the second and all arc between them. So 
you may see from this graph that uh, if, if let's say, if Ka bar has more than one vertex, say u and v, then there cannot be, then from u, if you want to reach v, you must take at least one, two, three, four steps. So that is equivalent to say that if a, b, c, d, a both greater than or equal to two, then there can be no uh, seekings. So we may need to drop the idea of proving that every kind, every this kind of digraph has a three king. But do they have a four king? Actually, the answer is positive. In fact, uh, in 2000, Gutin and Yale confirmed that every semi complete multipartite digraph with at most one source has a four king. So, in the rest of my lecture, I want to prove this theory in detail. Mm, and before I do that, I want to avail you a very simple observation of semi complete multipartite digraph which is used implicitly in the proof. So, so, so sorry, <laughs> the observation states that um, if for, for a pair of vertex U and V um, that is adjacent, uh, in which direction is, uh, it doesn't matter. And for another vertex W, we can say that U and V must belong to different parts, say part one and part two. Then W must belong to different parts of one of them. Say W is belong to part two, then there must be an arc from W to U because we are considering a semi-complete multipartite diagraph. Every, part, every uh, pair of vertex from different parts should be adjacent. Uh, so now let me show you some useful lemma that will be used. The first lemma is about a shortest path. So let me let us consider a shortest path from uh, P0 to PL, where L is greater than or equal to three. So we are con consider a path of minus at least three here. Then we can conclude that there exists a PL P0 path with length at most four. So how to prove this? Uh, actually, we can prove this by uh, using simply using this uh, observation. Uh, let's consider let's consider this arc and this vertex here. So by the observation, there must be an arc between them. And the arc cannot be in this direction because we are considered a shortest path here. So the arcs must be in this direction, either dominates P1 or dominates P, P0. Then we may consider the vertex P2 and P3 using the same argument and the vertex P0. There must be vortexes between P0 and P1 and P P3. And there can also cannot be in this direction because um, P is the shortest path, so must be in this direction, either from P2 to P0 or from P3 to P0. But in either case, we can get a path of the set most four here. Um, so, So this has been proved. Let us look at the next, next lemma here. Um, we use n plus i x to denote the, uh, the ISL neighborhood of x, which is which is the those vertex y 
with distance i from x. And we also use uh, the rotation here to denote the nth all close all neighborhood of x, which is those vortex that with distance at most i at most i from x. So the lemma here simply states that if there is a strong semi-complete multipartite digraph and W is a vortex in D. And if the eyes or neighborhood of W is not empty, then every vortex in the eyes or neighborhood should dominate all the vortex or should, should can reach all the vortex in the closed neighborhood of W in four arcs, within four arcs. So uh, I guess we are, I am a bit running out of time here. So let me end my lecture by showing you how to prove, how to prove it. So for M plus one, M plus two, the second or neighborhood, and M plus three, and plus i. And we take any vortex x in n plus i. Um, by, by lemma 21, we, we know that there is a path with, within four arcs from x to w. And for any other vortex yj in nj, n plus j, we may consider a shortest path so in the first case, if j is less than or equal to three and greater than or equal to one, we consider the shortest path from w to yj, w y1, y2, yj, or maybe in this case. And we consider this arc and this vortex here. By the observation, we can see that there must be an arc between them. And because X is in the ice or neighborhood, the arc must be in this direction. Dominates Y1, dominates W. So in either case, we can get a shortest path from X to uh, YJ. And uh, for the case, when j is greater than or equal to four, the proof is actually similar. I will leave that to you. Um, we actually only need to consider the pair uh, yj minus three, yj minus two and x. So I, I believe you can do that. It's just a similar argument. So I will escape this proof of the Lensering here, and because I have just write this um, in detail, and I believe I will send you a uh, the presentation. And just one thing to note is that the the last thing here only use the lemma uh, twenty two, so I will. So this is the end of my lecture. I would like to thank you for your attending and attention. Thank you.